This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, which is the last one before Valentine's Day. Of course, you may be thinking about buying some flowers to give on Sunday, so I thought, what better person to interview than a British flower grower? So I'm talking to Ben Cross of Crosslands Flower Nursery, a family-owned and run nursery specialising in cut alstrom areas. Ben is an expert grower, public speaker, an ambassador for British flowers and founder of the British Flowers Rock campaign. As you'll find out, growing flowers isn't all roses, but Ben loves what he does and he starts by giving some background on the nursery and his involvement. Yeah, well, I'm fourth generation with my great grandparents starting out on the Land Settlement Association. So some of the listeners may have heard of the LSA, but I'm sure all the listeners have heard of the Great Depression of the 30s. Um, A lot of shipbuilders, a lot of miners out of work. And basically the government set up a scheme where over 20 areas around the the country, um, sort of unemployed families would go and work and and farm the land. And my great grandparents, Albert and Louisa, were original. So one of the original um, families that sort of put up their hands, signed on the dotted line, and off they went from Abertal area down here to Chichester on the south coast and um, a place called Siddlesham. And that, that was the largest one of these LSAs, the land settlements. And then my granddad joined them after World War Two. He met my nan, who was a Pompey girl down the road here, had my dad, uncles and aunties uh, at Siddlesham on the LSA. And then basically when you were part of this government scheme, um, they would sell your produce through the scheme and, and take some of the, the money, basically. So they, I don't know, go, Mr. Cross, I've sold you cabbages for that much, your courgettes for this much, and here's your percentage. You know, they take a cut of your earnings. And I guess it, back then it was seen as a bit like a Kickstarter is seen as now. So um, my granddad got on with it really well, and uh, he was able to set up his own nursery, basically. So we moved from Siddlesham to Warburton, which is near Arundel. And if you don't know where Arundel is, it's near Chichester, which is basically 20 minutes um, west of Brighton, sort of in between Brighton and Portsmouth. And he bought what was then part of Barnum Nurseries. And he bought the bit of land where they used to grow their Christmas trees. So the first sort of product we sold from Crossland's were <laughs> Christmas trees. We had to make way for back then obviously wooden greenhouses and um, we moved here where I live today in 1957 so we've been going since 1936 and we've been here in Warburton since 1957 Uh, so that's sort of a brief history of of the LSA and it's a whole nother talk but um, it's sort of been interesting for me as the fourth generation of the nursery to sort of you know delve back into the history of of the 30s and the Land Settlement Association and there was a whole exhibition about it at um, the Wilden Downland Museum which is near me quite a big museum sort of a living museum and sort of my nan was interviewed and videoed and my dad and to go back through old photos and to learn about where we've come from where our roots you know originate from has been really interesting you know as a younger grower to have sort of the heritage and history behind us is um is really cool so it's been you know um it's been sort of an interesting story to find out about so um and then obviously your next question is going to be about why we specialize in ulster mary isn't it <laughs> it is yes it's quite 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 nicely on to <clears throat> basically when granddad bought the land where the nursery is at the moment um it was very much a continuation of what we were doing on the lsa which is growing a real diverse range of crops from flowers and um, salad crops and then we also had obviously uh, sheep chickens cattle <laughs> it was you know just everything uh but then the birth of the supermarkets uh, in the 50s 60s 70s you know people got used to having things all year round you know strawberries and blueberries for christmas and things way out of season and no longer could you grow lots of different things and make a living basically so it was it was time for him to specialize and um it was also the time of rising oil prices so oil was about 8p a litre <laughs> now it's about 80 odd p a litre and um Ulster Mary, it's known as a cool crop 
So um, basically it looks cool in your arrangements and in your vases, but obviously by a cool crop, it doesn't need as much heat input to um, to harvest the crop. And obviously it's an all year round crop as well. So back then we could supply the supermarkets, the wholesalers, all year round, a plethora, a smorgasbord of different colours and varieties. And um, it was a good alternative crop. And slowly but surely, the whole nursery came over to Alstrom area. And um, it sort of finished sort of becoming, you know, a bit of this and a bit of that. And it came over to all Alstrom area in the, in the 70s, really. So we've been doing Alstrom area, British Alstrom area since the 70s, sort of specialising in it. Yeah. Mm. And do you produce anything else now at the nursery? No, so we do over 50 varieties now, which is like growing 50 different varieties. Um, if your listeners ever can imagine coming here to Crosslands, we've obviously got big greenhouses and hundreds and hundreds of beds. And the beds are about a metre wide and 30 metres long. And we've got hundreds of beds, over 50 different varieties. And even if you walk through the greenhouse today, Every variety is different heights, uh, different thicknesses of, of growth where some have thinned out and some are coming back into flowering. Some like the winter, some like the summer. You know, they behave completely differently to one another. So it is like growing over 50 different types of plants because all the varieties behave completely differently. So it's not as easy as planting lots of different colours and they all grow the same. Uh, if it was that easy, you know, <laughs> it uh, wouldn't be that enjoyable. You know, it's quite nice to learn about new varieties and grow different types and things like that. So, um, so yeah, we, we specialise in it and we do over millions of stems and we do millions of stems over the course of the year um, with spring and autumn being when we're in season. So we're doing thousands of bunches a day in spring and autumn because that's when they're in season the soil temperature the air temperature the light levels everything is just sort of on its side so it just it's when it's in its pomp and at its best and then obviously in the summer the soil temperature gets too hot so the soil temperature gets up to about 30 odd degrees the air temperature is about 40 odd degrees so the roots in the soil they want to do what we want to do go to the beach and have an ice cream they want to chill out and they basically go into a period of dormancy where we uh, uh, harvest more than they can produce so production sort of tails off in the summer we're still picking and harvesting but not as much in the summer and then now in the winter obviously um, we don't have any artificial lighting so the good thing is we don't cause any light pollution but with the poor light levels through the winter uh, we, we don't get as much production either really but there's not really a demand for flowers between christmas and valentine's anyway so again it's a really good crop to grow because it's um it kind of goes to sleep when when it's not really wanted which is uh is handy so um yeah so spring and autumn that's sort of when we're in season even though we produce all year round yeah, I heard um, it may be an urban legend, but you, I think, are quite near to Selsey. And I remember someone telling me that Patrick Moore had moved down there because the light, the the skies were so good down there. So I imagine you probably wouldn't be flavour of the month if you started lighting up all your greenhouses, <laughs> if that story well, is true. <laughs> he does live here because we've got, uh, in Chichester, in China, us, we've got... Um... Uh, we've got a museum here and I actually saw him there but yeah I think he does he is around here and um, yeah we've obviously got the best light levels and the best soil and we're obviously between the South Downs National Park and the ocean the channel you know so um, it's warmer here in the winter and it's cooler here in the summer because we get the nice sea breeze so we're literally five minutes five minutes north of us is the downs and five minutes south of us is the beach so um it's sort of perfect growing growing weather and, and the downs a lot of that sort of westerly weather that comes from the west uh, the down sort of buffers that and takes it north north of us so um we're very lucky we've got a lovely little microclimate which is perfect for growing down here hence that's why the largest LSA, the largest land settlement the government put down here, you know, because it's, it's the best place for growing. Um, but unfortunately, um, there's not many, well, there's no other flower growers left here at all, really, of any of a large scale. But there is a um, tomato nursery and uh, pepper, a salad pepper 
nursery and they're I don't know 40 50 acres each and they do have artificial lighting but as I say we grow the crop very naturally apart from putting a little bit of heat into the greenhouses which is um through biomass so it's all sustainable we've got um good wood and slinden estates around where we are a lot of wood needs to be managed a lot of trees need to be managed so all of that wood gets made into pellets and we we burn that managed wood um but remember i say it's a cool crop anyway so it only needs 13 degrees in the greenhouses at night time so if we were growing tomatoes or other types of flowers you know, you'd need 20 degrees in there at night in the winter, you know, but Austria Mare, it's a very sustainable crop. So we don't use a lot of heat anyway. So um, mm. apart from that, we grow it very naturally. Yeah. Yeah. When we originally spoke, I was impressed by, um, you know, how organic and sustainable the business is. Um, are there any other things that you do uh, to that end? Yeah. I mean, we're not to- obviously totally organic because, um we need to use um, nutrients in the soil <laughs> and uh, things like that to, to make a good crop. You know, you, you, need, you obviously need good levels of calcium for vars life. Uh, you need you know, good levels of nitrogen for obviously leaf stem growth and good levels of potassium, potash for flowering, for nice, big, fat, juicy, vibrant buds, you know. So we're not completely organic, but so we've got sustainable uh, heating and Ulstermere, British Ulstermere is also known as a dry crop. So, you know, we're not draining the <laughs> River Arran or draining lakes around us like they are in obviously other other countries where water usage is more problematic. We we only water um, 20 minutes once a month in the winter and 20 minutes once every 10 days in the summer. So it's a cool crop and it's a dry crop. And also we only replant about less than five percent of the crop a year so we've got hundreds and hundreds of beds of roots and plants but we only replant seven or eight beds a year so a lot of our beds are over 20 30 years old still producing good saleable stems you know um to this day so it's uh, if we were growing a different type of flower or salad crops or other things in the greenhouse we'd be going out all the greenhouse getting all the plant material out sterilizing the soil ready for the new plants to come back in but as i say we only replant less than five percent of the crop a yeah. year so it's very very sustainable yeah yeah and and who do you supply to you and and, and are there kind of issues around packaging? Do you need to be careful about what you send out? Are, are you mindful of that as well? Yeah. Well, the, f- the first question first, who we supply. I mean, um, in sort of granddad's time and dad's early days, we used to obviously supply wholesalers um, like Brighton, Southampton, Portsmouth, Covent Garden. And we even used to send up to Manchester, Birmingham, Sheffield, you know, the Midland markets as well as supplying all the all the supermarkets um but one by one the supermarkets went for the foreign uh, cheaper stuff and so did the wholesalers so um it sort of changed over the years we used to say supply all of the supermarkets and literally valentine's day this year <laughs> Sainsbury's phoned me up and said oh ben we don't want your flowers anymore because we can get them 4p cheaper a bunch from columbia you know <laughs> Um, so they were the last one to go, but luckily Morrison's have come in and they've been far more ethical, uh, getting behind the British Flowers Rock campaign and the British Flowers and more sustainable flowers. So we've been dealing with Morrison's, so we supply them and they've been great so far. And, um, let's say going back to wholesalers, I mean, we don't even send to Covent Garden anymore, which is only an hour and a bit north of us. Um, you know, granddad used to get 195 a bunch. And we used to send hundreds of boxes a week to Covent Garden. But even if I sent a handful of boxes now, we'd get, you know, 50p a bunch. It's uh, just not worth it. So we've had to diversify and we supply uh, florists, uh, florists that work out of their home studios, uh, farm shops, uh, restaurants and cafes. Uh, We supply the public, um, direct to the public. So we've obviously to survive (laughs) had to... um, you know supply you know change who we supply and um we've just found people that care about the planet and the carbon footprint and care about where their produce comes from and um and that's the way we've sort of gone with it really so um and talking about sort of packaging 
the really good thing is that we still have a lot of local people, local um, florists and um, restaurants, cafes that come into us for the flowers and they just collect the flowers. So they're package free because even if I wrap my flowers in paper, <laughs> papers still come from trees, right? So the best way to buy anything, if it's flowers or food or anything, is obviously package free. So um, people locally, they come and literally just collect the stems of flowers. And then when we have to send them nationwide, they go into recyclable um, sleeves. And obviously um, a lot of flowers that go around the world are in hydropack. So they're in plastics with water. And obviously they add a lot of chemicals and use chemicals to clean those plastic packagings and things like that. But we don't do any of that. Ours just a very happy in a cardboard box, which can be recycled or reused. So um, they're quite sort of low maintenance, you know, for transporting. So um, and I'd say the, the big difference as well is that a lot of Alstomeria that comes into our country. Yes, they've got the packaging around the bunch. But each individual bud, primary bud, you know, those sort of six pack beer cans, you know, the plastic packaging. Imagine um, a miniature version of that. So you've got this plastic netting and that is wrapped around each individual primary bud of that bunch as well. <laughs> and then you your cable ties and your other bits that go with it. I mean, the amount of packaging used within the flower industry has got to be more than the food industry. You think of all those delicate flowers and all of the cable ties and plastics and the sellotapes and things like that that are used to keep flowers, you know, um, looking okay. It's it's amazing, you know, the amount of packaging used used in just one box of flowers that's coming from Ecuador, Ethiopia, Colombia, Kenya. <laughs> mm. It's uh, it's incredible, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say about Covent Garden actually because I have been up there uh, for for various work reasons, um, and I know that they did a big campaign around British flowers. And when you go up there now, a lot of people, a lot of florists who shop there, will tell you that you know, oh, there's a big push for British flowers, and the wholesalers up there are trying to source more British flowers. So it's interesting that you say actually, it it might not be that they don't want to use British flowers or don't want to use you, but actually from well, your point of view. They make a on the foreign stuff, can't they? The, the wholesalers, they, they buy in and, and sell. That's their their job, you know, and um, if they can buy something, you know, a good price and sell it for high, they make a bigger margin. <laughs> it's uh, the way the world goes. Um, so, um, yeah, but we, we still supply Brighton Market um, because I do – the British Flowers Rock campaign um, quite heavily locally. Um, for example, we used to just supply five boxes to them. Now we supply over 20 boxes a week to that market because of the education, the awareness. And, um, you know, it's not all to do with price. It's also to do with the planet carbon footprint. They're, they're going to produce a bigger flower. They're going to produce a more vibrant flower and they're going to last longer. So it's, um, you know, buying cheapest isn't always the best, as as we all know, with cars and computers and other things. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's quality as well, isn't it? And consistency. So, um, yeah. So um, Brighton's going quite well down down here. Yeah. Good. And, and what is the British Flowers Rock campaign and what caused you to start it? Um, well, I actually did marine biology for over 10 years. So I sort of lived around the world. Um, doing that and as a kid obviously growing up on the nursery and where we are here is you know in the country so I always wanted to sort of be involved with the environment and help the planet as best as I could even from a kid you know um, so I went off and did that and then I came back um, because I sort of got fed up of you know finding a rare bird but they'd still build a wind farm or finding a rare bit of coral but they'd still dig for oil or you know you were a tiny person in, in a big cog if you like um and i obviously came back to the nursery during my holidays and christmases and mother's day to help out and things like that and um i just got fed up of seeing lots of nurseries like us um being smashed down to build red brick houses on and um you know so it's sort of in my blood and it clicked and i came i did marine biology from 2000 to 2011 i came back here in 2011 and I got in touch with the NFU, with DEFRA, had local MPs come out um, to really, you know, sort this problem out. And from 2011 to 2014, 
I sort of went down that route of trying to get people to help us and make a difference, but it just wasn't happening. No one could be bothered really. Um, so, but I was, so I basically thought, well, I'll just do it myself then if no one's going to do it. And um, in 2014, I came up with the British Flowers Rock campaign, which is all about talking to people like you and the public and people that may not know what's going on with the UK flower industry. And, you know, just just if someone can just click on another extra one, five, ten percent in their brain <laughs> when they go and buy flowers, um, then we've, we've done our job. So it's all about education, awareness product placement in shops and labeling in shops for example we are 20 30 years behind um, where food is now so to give you an example british bacon can no longer be called british bacon if it was danish bacon but packed in britain you know mm. uh, we've got the red traffic light system on our cereal boxes when you walk up to the fish counter you should be buying whole fish and you're looking for your sustainable fish logo when you walk up to the egg counter hardly we don't even have any sort of battery hen eggs it's either barn or free range but with flowers you walk into a supermarket you've got a big cascade of flowers in front of you uh, for example the sainsbury and chichester says we support 100 percent british flowers oh do you that says israel iran egypt colombia holland <laughs> it's it, it's mixed messaging and the whole purpose is we should have a flower stand and another british seasonal flower stand and you know better labeling better product placement would be a start you know so you'll have a christmas bouquet it'll be christmas bouquet 10 quid and that's all that you as a consumer will be told it won't you won't be told what chemicals are on the packaging what chemicals are on the flowers not its carbon footprint when it was picked where it was harvested where it was packaged you've got no information apart from what what's in the you know what flowers it is and how much it is and it's it's just not good enough you know, it's um, it's uh, it's not good enough um, education or awareness for the public to make a, an informative choice, really, is it? So, no. So you're campaigning yeah. to well raise awareness, Every, as you say, yeah. and and <laughs> and to kind of you know get better regulations around labelling, I suppose. Exactly. That's one mm. thing. I mean, that would be a start. And you know, if it's from Kenya, say it's from Kenya in big bold writing, so people, you know. <laughs> know where it's come from um i mean i remember my first british flowers rock gig i did in 2014 um it was a, a gardening group with over 100 people and um, when i said over 90 percent of flowers are imported you should have seen their faces they were gasping they were like no this can't be right i was like yep <laughs> you know and there they were that's a gardening club and and that you know so imagine just the general public every time i do a I do about 50, 60 talks a year. I've been doing a lot, obviously, over Zoom uh, within the greenhouses over the last 10 months. But, um, yeah, there's, there's always that reaction where people just can't, they can't fathom it. You know, they just can't get to grips with it. And it just takes that bit of awareness and education to make people sort of think. Um, and if so, if it makes them think a little bit, well, then, you know, I've done my sort of bit, you know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, well, how will it affect you post Brexit or how will it affect British flower growers? How will it affect kind of imports, consumers? What is it going to be better, do you think, for British flower well, I growers? I really don't know because, as, as I've said, I mean, a lot of our flowers come from outside the EU. They come from places like, let's say, Colombia, South Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Ecuador. Um, so I really, um, I really don't know how how it's going to go really um and obviously a, a lot of stuff is um comes over in shipping containers as well so uh, when we used to deal with some of the supermarkets they wanted a five week forecast so basically it takes about five weeks <laughs> from a flower in ecuador to then go onto a shipping container get frozen to about half a degree pump full of chemicals to keep it looking fresh <laughs> then it goes around the world in a shipping container and obviously a lot gets flown as well and obviously, a lot of these boats and planes are going back to wherever they came from empty as well. So half the carbon footprint is is just stuff going back empty as well because we don't produce anything that anyone wants anymore. So it's um, there's that to think about as well. So, yeah, I don't know how it's um, going to go because obviously 
in Holland, you'd think, oh, there'll be loads of Alstomira growers just in Holland. But there's only 12. <laughs> and there used to be a lot more because even the Dutch are finding it hard with the cheap imports coming in and out of Holland. Um, they find it hard. And uh, California, California used to be a really big flower hub there, but they're feeling the effects of the cheap Colombian stuff as well. So it's uh, it's not just the UK, it's other places that are being affected with obviously the um, the, the cheaper flowers from around the world as well. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure how how Brexit's going to go, but I'm sure if people want cheap cheap cars, cheap clothes, cheap flowers, they can get it. Uh, and if they don't, if they want to think, you know, a bit more, then they can they can buy more sustainably and locally. It's it's the same with everything, isn't it? You know, clothes and food and other bits. You know, so um, yeah, flowers flowers are no different. You know, and at the end of the day, if it all comes down to money, well, that's not the point of the British flowers rock thing. It's all about the planet. You know, it doesn't matter if it's cheaper, more expensive, or whatever. The most important thing is that they're better for the environment <laughs> and saving our our heritage you know like our family big family businesses and things like that so because um even i'm a fourth generation young grower i've got you know i didn't go to horticultural college or anything but i've grown up here i've got lessons from my great granddad my granddad my dad my uncles my aunties my mum you know they've all taught me how to grow the ulstrom area firsthand and you just can't you can't go to college and learn that or university and learn that you know it's and we're losing a lot of you know family businesses like that and you just lose so much information and and sort of raw sort of you know other talented talented growers you just lose it you know because it would just be a standard format of learning whereas i've learned you know organically who you could put it you know mm. and how many if, if say i wanted to go and buy i don't know say i want to buy a mixed bunch of flowers um and i want them to be completely grown in the uk what would be my options as a consumer? Um, well, so we do supply the public. So um, we supply um, sort of skinny boxes. Uh, that's just twenty pounds for. Uh, I hate to plug it, <laughs> but for twenty pounds, you get four big bunches of British Alstomera delivered to your door. Um, so we do supply the public, um, and obviously try and support your local florist instead of a supermarket um and if you do have a local florist or a local farm shop or veggie shop you know go into those places and say oh we heard ben on roots and all podcast here's his instagram at ulstromero ben go and you know buy flowers from him, him instead of other places or check out flowers from the farm um website and you know see if there's a local grower to where you are and then if you've only got a supermarket it becomes very difficult but Sometimes they are labelled with the Union Jack flag. So, for example, uh, British tulips will be in season. And then obviously we'll have the British daffodils and then we'll have the sweet williams, the gladioli and then the sunflowers. Um, so you do get British flowers in the supermarkets, but it's quite challenging and hard to pin them down because <laughs> of the poor labelling and product placement. But you generally, as I say, get get your tulips uh, and then your daffodils and sweet williams and things like that through the summer. So um, there are still British flowers in the supermarkets. But remember that if you're shopping at a supermarket and buying British flowers, you're not buying them at the correct price. <laughs> mm, yes. uh, to give you some idea, um, the supermarkets, um, we used to get about 20 odd P a stem for the, from the supermarkets in the 80s and 90s. And they even used to give us a bit more of them in the winter to you know pay for the fuel costs but now supermarkets want them from about 10p a stem from 20 odd p in the 80s to 10p in 2021 it's uh you can see it's unsustainable so let's say if if people listening can go to the grower direct is great if they can't then please support your local farm shop or vet or florist and then if you can't do that and you've only got a supermarket then um really try and look out for the for the labeling uh which is which is hard but as i say um a lot of growers like me we we use couriers to you know deliver them to people's houses anyway so it's uh there's loads of options to to buy british now which is really good i think a lot of growers like me have sort of gone with the times you know on social media and and things like that so um it's slowly getting out there i think a bit more to the public which is good yeah and would you recommend it 
Would you recommend it as a career or a business venture for someone? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I don't think of myself as a business person <laughs> at all. Um, I mean, it's it's a lifestyle. Um, I, I always say it's like farming, just with flowers. So, for example, in the summer, you think, oh, yeah, you can just chill out and just grow. The well, no, because you've got the irrigation to look after. And then in the winter, you think, oh, you know, surely they just go dormant, the poor like, well, no, I've got the biomass boilers to... <laughs> you know if they break at night and things like that it's a freezing night so it's you know we live on site where we work and it's just like farming but with flowers so it's very much i would say a lifestyle rather than a business if that makes sense from where i'm coming from um so um i do it because i'm passionate about it and i love it and i believe in right and wrong and what's good for the planet and what's not good for the planet if you know what i mean so um yeah, but as I say, if you if you're into that kind of stuff like I am, it's a great career. And and talking about that, we we do apprenticeship schemes with horticultural colleges. Um, so we work with like Brinsbury Spa Shop, Plumpton Colleges, and we do work placements for students. And a lot of those students now um, have worked for us and still work for us. And it's really good um, on their CVs and um, to get really good experience. You know, so. Um, yeah, I love doing. I love working with the, with the students. Um, I sort of go into the colleges, do the British Flowers Rock Talk, and then all of the students come out for like a tour. Or over lockdown, they've been having the Zoom tour, and then yeah, we offer the the work placements as well, one or two work placements a year. So um, yeah, we've built up those relationships with those colleges sort of the last sort of five six years since 2014. So um, it's good that the colleges are getting on board with it as well. You know. It's great that Crosslands are working with colleges to foster the next generation of growers. Thank you to Ben for taking time out to speak about the nursery and about the British Flowers Rock campaign. I know we didn't touch on the cultivation aspect of Alstrom area as much, but that would have been a whole other episode, so perhaps another time. When I first spoke to Ben, I was really bowled over by his enthusiasm for British flowers and his love for his nursery and its history. As I listened back to the interview to edit it, It struck me when he spoke about how year on year he gets squeezed on price. I know I've said it before, but how and where we spend our money affects growers like Ben. And we need to vote with our wallets for the sort of future that we want. Fighting what we don't want by withdrawing our money from it is, I believe, the most powerful form of protest that we have. If you want to support Ben and the nursery, he's very active online. He's at Alstromaria Ben on Twitter and Instagram. And look up Crossland's Nursery on Facebook. You'll find pictures of the nursery, Ben's instructional videos. You can ask him any questions and buy some flowers. Thank you as always for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about tobacco whitefly. Precisely 30 years ago, the vast winter vegetable crops of California became headline news around the globe. Since they'd rapidly succumbed to phenomenal infestations of tobacco whitefly, a sap-sucking insect that was assumed to be just a relatively minor pest within tropical and subtropical countries around the world. However, this one millimetre long sap-sucking bug was so numerous in California that many trillions of them formed dense swirling fogs as they moved amongst the crops. This unprecedented event resulted in a catastrophic yield loss of around half a billion dollars but also presented a mystery as to why a previously insignificant insect should suddenly have become such an extraordinary crop pest. So entomologists throughout the world, including myself, were asked to investigate. We began by setting up international science networks, which then enabled the Californian whitefly to be studied and compared to tobacco whitefly populations from many other countries. And as the research was collated, it became clear that the Californian whitefly was very different to the others. It produced more eggs, transmitted many plant viruses, and most worryingly, was resistant to insecticides and highly polyphagous. It was in fact a new superbug, a type of the tobacco whitefly that had rapidly evolved to survive the chemicals that were being extensively used within crop protection. As the research continued, diagnostic tests were developed 
that easily distinguished the superbug from other tobacco whitefly populations and enabled it to be tracked across the world, which soon revealed that the superbug had already spread to all continents and that it was linked to the global trade in ornamental plants, dispersing out from infested importations onto field and horticultural crops. Discovering this was a breakthrough, since it enabled the whitefly's migration routes to be intercepted. Then, by using integrated crop protection strategies instead of repetitive chemical treatments, the whitefly's insecticide resistance levels were reduced, and so its control within crops throughout the world became more manageable. Despite this, though, the superbug strain of the tobacco whitefly remains a serious plant pest and transmitter of crop viruses within warmer regions of the world, which includes southern Europe. And even here in the UK, it remains high on the national list of notifiable pests and is one of the reasons why ornamental plants, such as imported poinsettias, continue to be checked at our borders. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.